Okay, so earlier today we had a talk on solar power. Thank you very much. It was a great talk. Um, this solar power is, is a technology that has huge potential, and uh, it's something that I'm looking forward to. And uh, I think it, it will change the world as we see it forever. Uh, unfortunately, we are a few generations off from that. So until then, we need something to uh, keep our energy demands going. And that something is uh, the future of nuclear energy. Now, um, I'm not talking about nuclear energy in the sense that we think it today of, of these large, massive power reactors. I'm talking about an old technology that I honestly think will be re, will reemerge as a new technology. Um, before I talk about that, let's talk about the future of nuclear today. This right here is a construction site just outside of uh, uh, Augusta, Georgia, where they hold the, the Masters Golf Tournament. Um, this right here is the first brand new construction site for nuclear power in almost 35 years. That's, that's amazing. This truly stands as a testament to our country's um, uh, goals to generate clean energy and uh, things like that. So one thing that you might notice is that, is that you see a, a nuclear uh, reactor back here. Uh, these are not the nuclear reactors, just, just a quick nuclear energy lesson. These are cooling towers. There's more of those on coal plants than there are actually nuclear plants. These, these are these domes. Those are the, uh, the buildings that house the nuclear reactors. So they're building two brand new nuclear reactors on a site that already has two nuclear reactors running. So this will be the first four nuclear reactor power plant in the country. Um, when these two plants come online, they will add 2.2 gigawatts of nearly emission-free electricity to the grid. And I say nearly because, well, the people have to drive to work. So the, there's your emissions right there. Uh, here's actually a picture of me working at Vogel 1 and 2. I uh, can't tell if I'm working hard or hardly working. And uh, there's probably something scary on the other side of the door. Not sure what, but uh, I made for a good picture, I guess. I'm really sweaty because I've been running around the plant for like the past three hours, so good stuff. But anyways, so uh, the plant that they're building, the type of reactor that they're building is called the AP-1000. And uh, AP-1000 uh, is a Westinghouse reactor. And uh, I'm not going to call it the next generation of nuclear technology, but it's not really the previous generation of nuclear technology. And the reason why it's not the previous is because there's brand new safety systems built around this thing. So uh, all the safety systems are passive safety systems. In other words, it requires no human intervention for the safety systems to kick in in the event of a, of a catastrophe of whatever proportion. Um, and I stand here before you, and I tell you that this thing is safe. But unfortunately, most of you are going to look back at me and say, you're crazy. After what I saw that happened in Japan, there's no way these things are safe. You know, I saw the faces on the people. I saw the water carrying it away. I saw the explosions. And, and you're really not going to believe me that this thing is safe when I tell you that all of the reactor systems are exactly the same. We've got the same uh, core. We've got the same pressure vessel, the same steam generators, the same pressurizers. The only thing that's different is the package it comes in. It's just new safety systems designed around the same thing. So instead of me standing here and, and talking for the next you know five or so minutes on how this thing right here is totally safe. We don't need to worry about it. That, that's just a waste of mine and your time because it's a whole lot easier for myself as a nuclear engineering student to explore the possibilities of designing a new type of reactor that is completely safe, that doesn't you know, run on these same things. Because, I mean, it's, face it, it's worthless me trying to sell this same thing that's, that we've seen fail time and time again to you. So the real future of nuclear technology, it needs to be intrinsically safe, not passively safe. The AP and AP-1000 stands for advanced passive. So they're really selling this passive safety idea. It needs to achieve a higher fuel burn up and produce less waste. Uh, nuclear waste is a problem. It, it really shouldn't be a problem because we're managing it well, even though we don't have a mountain to throw it in. But, that, but like I said, instead of educating people and telling them that it's not a problem, let's just eliminate the problem. We need something that can recycle nuclear weapons material. Now, I'm not going to be the first nuclear engineering student to stand up here and say that nuclear weapons are an abomination. Uh, nobody should have them. They're, 
They're just terrible, okay? We all know what they do, and we're all scared of them, and I'm scared of them, and we should be for many, many good reasons. So there's two ways to eliminate them. One, we can wait around for the uh, elements inside the that uh, generate the massive explosions to decay. And that, that, that'll take on the order of several billion years to million years, uh, whichever uh, type of bomb we're talking about. So that whole time while we're waiting for it to decay, this thing's dangerous. It can still be used as a bomb. So I don't see that as a, as a pathway to eliminating these things. Um, but what I do see is that we can take the plutonium and the uranium that are in these bombs and we can blend it into something that we can put into a reactor. And, and it's really kind of iffy on, on today's type of reactors. Uh, there's a lot of complicated things that go it's way over my head. So we need something new that can take care of this problem. We need something that can reprocess the fuel. And this goes along with uh, eliminating the waste problem altogether. Uh, we can reprocess this stuff into great things. Like I said, not, not even into more fuel. Uh, about half of a core offload from a current nuclear reactor can power, uh, is like a full core offload of a current nuclear reactor is half, half of fuel. I mean, this thing creates its own fuel and that's incredible. But we need a way to reprocess it, a way to get the fuel out, a way to get the medical isotopes that we all need out of it. Uh, we're running so short on medical isotopes that hospitals are having to build their own accelerators to generate these things. So, so these, are, these are all topics that need to be resolved. And I'm here to tell you that they have been resolved before. And the story about the reactor and how it was invented, this new technology, is way more profound than how it works. So I'm going to go ahead and tell you this story. Uh, we're going to fast forward, or rewind, I guess, back to uh, the end of World War II. And uh, what you're looking at is the uh, graphite reactor out at uh, Oak Ridge National Labs. Now, this is the first permanent nuclear reactor in the world. And its sole purpose was to generate weapons-grade nuclear materials. So fast forward a little bit more. Um, so the war's over. Great. Um, so now we have a bunch of nuclear scientists, the original nuclear scientists, standing around at Oak Ridge like this. You know, they've got their hands in their pockets because the government gave Oak Ridge a call and said, hey, we're taking your reactor program away and we're going to give it to Argonne National Labs. So uh, I don't know, just do whatever you've been doing. It's, it's been working so far. So we had all these, all these technicians and scientists sitting around with, with, they can't do what they wanted to do all along. They can't take their craft that was designed for war and implement it for peace until Okay, here's a good start. Here's a good part. Until they got a call from the most unlikely of sources, okay? They got a call from the Air Force, of all people. You see, at the time we had our nuclear submarines and our uh, Army modular reactors, so now the Air Force thought that it was their turn to have their very own nuclear-powered bombers. Um, so this, the purpose of this thing was to be essentially the doomsday machine, okay? We were going to, it was in the middle of the Cold War, so we were going to take this airplane, we were going to fly it all the way over to Russia, and we were just going to end the world right, right then and there. And um, because at the time we didn't have ICBMs, missiles that could launch from here and hit there, we didn't have uh, helicopters or airplanes that could refuel our airplanes while they're still in the air. We needed something that could make a nonstop trip from here to there. So this is what the uh, Air Force had in mind, okay? It's crazy stuff. So the thing about it that makes it so outrageous is that a nuclear sub makes sense because, well, you don't need to burn up the oxygen to create propulsion from the engines. And obviously, oxygen is, is a very rare commodity on, on a submarine. And the power reactors, they made sense because uh, you didn't have to take the fuel out of your Humvees and your tanks to create electricity, to keep your soldiers warm, to keep them fed, and things like that. But a nuclear-powered bomber didn't, didn't, didn't make sense because the amount of pressure that it takes to keep a light water reactor running is outrageous. And an airplane, especially, is a very pressure-conscious environment. So director of Oak Ridge <laughs> National Lab at the time, Alvin Weinberg, he took this call, and uh, he thought that uh, this was a good way to get his reactor scientist back into the reactor business. On the side of practicality, however, he said this. 
that the purpose was unattainable, if not foolish. That wasn't important. A high temperature reactor could be used for other purposes, even if it never propelled an airplane. In other words, he said, um, it's a really bad idea, okay? However, I want to get my guys back into doing what they want to be doing, and even if this thing never flies an airplane, it could have so many uses on the ground. And the reason for that is because a reactor like this would have to be so perfect, so safe, so simple, so cheap, so everything that the current generation of nuclear power isn't. So this reactor that I'm about to show you, it, was not, it didn't come about through a series of improvements on the current reactors that we had. This thing was like thrust into existence out of just the most insane uh, request possible. So the Oak Ridge National Labs, they worked on it. They built a reactor, and it ran for four years as designed. And still today, it holds several records for achieving the highest temperatures, the highest all kinds of stuff. So this thing was really advanced for its time. And the reactor that they came up with was the liquid fluoride thorium reactor. I can sit here and break down this, this, this slide for the next hour, but I, I don't have an hour, so I'm not going to do that. And if you aren't asleep already, you would be really quickly. Um, but uh, the key word here is liquid. Our, our reactors today are solid fuel. So instead of using solid uranium, this thing uses a blend of liquid, uran li liquid uranium dissolved in fluoride salts and liquid thorium dissolved in fluoride salts. So this thing right here, it, is, it fits the epitome of safety. I mean, you could literally chuck this thing on an airplane and fly it around and it, and it not, you know, just be a, a missile. Uh, and the reason for that is, is because, like I said before, current reactors have to run at extraordinarily high temperatures, or excuse me, pressures. And this thing, it doesn't need that much pressure, just a little bit. Um, it's already liquid, so melting down, well, it's not so much of a problem as, as it is a feature. Um, <laughs> and another amazing thing is that it breeds its own fuel. In other words, in current reactors, we just throw a bunch of uranium in there. We, we use about 2% of it, and it runs at about less than 1% efficiency. And if you're trying to pitch this new reactor technology and tell to a room of engineers and you say, oh, it, and it runs at less than 1% efficiency, they're just going to laugh and get up and walk out the room. I mean, it's ridiculous. So you put uranium in it to start it, and then that's it. That's all the uranium you need. You just funnel thorium through it, and the thorium turns into uranium. It's not that as simple as I just said, but it happens. And <laughs> it does. Like I said, it takes an hour to explain this thing. And uh, so you don't have this big waste issue. We're not, we're not wasting our fuel. We're using all of it, and we're using most of it. And, uh, and that's what makes this thing so special, is that it is safe. I believe that this 1960s technology is pretty much going to be our future, unless we get awesome solar stuff first. But uh, so the, the key point here is that the AP1000, it's great. It's great. It's, it's, it's showing that we're willing to take the next step. But the problem is, is, is it's not anything new. We need to be investing in reactor types whose safety depends on physical realities. The laws of physics need to dictate that this thing is safe, not the probability that some mechanical or passive control is going to kick in at the right time. And we need to be investing our research dollars and time and money and effort into technologies like the lifter and ADRs, or, ac or accelerator-driven reactors, which Hopefully, if I'm invited back next year, I can talk to you about them. Thank you very much.